So this was about the forced electorship and its being established in 1928 in honor and memory of the sister and brother-in-law of Miss Edith Sweetbrook. It was her request that in each, can you hear me now? A little. What do I have to do? <laughs> It was her request that in each academic year at least one lecture be given on the immortality of the soul or some kindred spiritual subject, not as part of a regular college course, but by an authority specially qualified and specially appointed for the purpose. You could hear it. The flouting of social convention, wrote Romela Tapar some years ago, and the investing of it with charisma and moral authority has been characteristic of Indian society. Here then is a scholar worth listening to, for she is likely to tell us something new and not simply confirm our cherished beliefs. Romila Tapa was born in India. She studied at Punjab and London universities, lectured widely in Britain, where she broadcast frequently from the BBC, France, uh, other European countries, China, and elsewhere in Asia, and in this country at the universities of Chicago, Cornell, Pennsylvania, and the University of California at Berkeley. She has been a professor of ancient Indian history at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi since 1970. She has conducted archaeological surveys and excavations in India. She has received many high honors, refused at least one, and is a fellow of the Royal Asiatic <laughs> Society and the Royal Historical Society. Her first book, Ashoka and the Decline of the Mauryas, immediately made her famous, and it already possessed many characteristics of her later work, such as a thorough knowledge of the sources, literary, epigraphical, and archaeological, combined with a rare independence of outlook and a profound originality. In the Ashoka book, she showed, among other things, that the great king of Indian antiquity did not simply convert to Buddhism for what we would call religious reasons and was not the monster of piety that is described in the Buddhist texts, but that he did well to accommodate his reign to the prevailing intellectual and social movement of his day, which is what Buddhism was. Among her other books, which include The Past and Prejudice, Ancient Indian Social History, From Lineage to State, The Mauryas Revisited, Exile and the Kingdom, Some Thoughts on the Ramayana. I should mention especially the first volume of her Pelican History of India, which made her known in very wide circles and which displays all the characteristics of her work. Not confined to dynasties and political history, Tapar has always paid attention to society, to economics, and to culture. It is in that connection that she became interested in the cluster of topics about which I expect that she will talk to us today. But before that happens, I should mention something that is less widely known. Robin Atapa also wrote children's books about Indian history, and these have even led to controversies. Her casual mention, for example, of the Vedic Indians eating of beef caused protests in India with some, with some people asserting that it was not true and others conceding that it was true but maintaining that it was not good to tell children about it. <laughs> Here then is Romila Tapa addressing you under the auspices of the post lectureship on sacrifice, surplus, and the soul. Professor Tapa. Thank you very much, Professor Stahl. I would like to begin by expressing my deep appreciation to the Foster Committee and to the University for inviting me to give a lecture in, these, in this series. Um, my um, apprehensions have been increased by looking at this little pamphlet which gives the list of my predecessors. And when I see some of the eminent names there, I really feel extremely shy about standing up here myself. Uh, but I, I, I'm pleased to be here, largely because Ber Berkeley is possibly my favorite campus in the United States, and it's always a pleasure to come back to Berkeley. Um, speaking on the theme of the immortality of the soul is, for a historian, of course, a tremendous challenge. It's not the kind of subject that we normally deal with. And in trying to grapple with the subject and accept this challenge, I know that I'm venturing into an area which is new, 
I am doing it, I must confess, rather tentatively, but at the same time realizing that it's the kind of investigation which is what makes history an intellectually challenging and exciting discipline. Uh, so with that background, I'll say what I have to say. The sage Yajnavalkya, discoursing on the transmigration of the soul from one body to the next, describes it as analogous with the caterpillar. Describes it as analogous with the caterpillar who, when it comes to the end of a leaf, draws itself together and moves on to another leaf. Or else, like the goldsmith, Taking a piece of gold transforms it into another shape, more beautiful perhaps than the first. Both analogies, which occur in the Upanishads, are actions which result in change. In the first, there is movement from one object to another, and in the second, there is a mutation within the same substance. These ideas are crucial to the understanding of the soul and of immortality, as developed in the Upanishads. These were the earliest recorded discourses, as they are often called, of any length in India on theories of the immortality of the soul. The two analogies concretize the essence of the doctrine of transmigration, which was to become culturally hegemonic as the bedrock of religious thinking among many sects in India. It might therefore be worthwhile to examine more closely the initial process which enabled this doctrine to take root. The Upanishads, as a subject of scholarship, have generally been left to the domain of philosophers, grammarians, and philologists. However, texts, and especially those with such specific concerns, are anchored in points of time, which give them a historical dimension. The historical moment is linked both to the genesis of the idea and to its reception, two aspects with which this lecture is concerned. The Upanishads are at one level philosophical speculations on an abstract theme, but at another they are embedded in the society to which they relate. They encapsulate a process which leads to the formulation of an ideology. The interaction of this ideology with its environment, its source of power, and its historical ambiance needs to be inquired into. Ideology speaks of and from a social order, and ideas can be used to justify or legitimate the particular order. This is not to suggest that there is a simplistic correlation, a one-to-one -one correlation between ideology and society, for ideology is not just a pale reflection of reality. In many early societies, ideology is incorporated into religious beliefs, but articulated in ritual. If ritual is tied to the social order, then its questioning can also be seen as the questioning of that social order. In early Indian thought, ritual is viewed as action, karma. Therefore, it has been suggested that it would be more appropriate to speak of orthopraxy rather than of orthodoxy. The period of composition of the early and major Upanishads is generally and approximately from about the 8th to the 6th centuries BC. There are later texts uh, as well, but this is the uh, approximate time period of the major texts. They emerge out of earlier compositions stemming from the Rig Veda and the Brahmanas in particular, but deviating sufficiently from these origins to become foundational to new groups of thinkers. Some of these were to take conservative perspectives, and others, such as the Buddhists, were to be regarded as heterodox. They represent, therefore, a watershed between the Vedic corpus and the new ideologies, epitomizing features of what has often been called an axial age. 
The earlier texts emphasized the centrality of the sacrificial ritual, whereas the new ideologies move away from this and explore alternative eschatologies with initially at least an absence of ritual. The historian's concern is with why this change occurred. It has been argued that possibly <coughs> the Upanishads represent an interaction between Indo-European or Aryan ideas and the belief and practices of the local non-Aryans or pre-Aryans in northern India. However, now that it is conceded that we cannot identify any group specifically as Aryan, it becomes <coughs> difficult to support an argument that insists so precisely on the differentiation of Aryan and non-Aryan. It might, therefore, be more feasible to look at other aspects of the historical background. This lecture is not intended to explore all the historical changes of the time, but rather to examine more closely the relevance of a few of these. The Upanishads were explorations in the search for enlightenment on the human condition and release from its bonds. This was not a situation involving priest and ritual, nor the regular teacher and pupil learning of the Vedic tradition. This knowledge was part of the oral tradition, but was deliberately kept to a limited audience. The teachers were unconventional, and those whom they taught were specially selected. The latter could, however, include those who would normally be excluded from Vedic ritual, uh, such as those of uncertain origin, Satyakama is, is one person who is mentioned in this context, and women, such as Maitreyi. <coughs> they are included, perhaps, one feels, to make a point. The legitimacy of Brahman teachers was sought to be established by their status in lists of succession relating to their function as priests. The Kshatriya teachers had no particular qualifications. The Kshatriyas were the Rajas, the chiefs, the oligarchs, the term Kshatriya being derived from Kshatra meaning power. The form of dialogue was new, and in breaking away from ritual and mantra, it seemed to be a rationalizing movement. But at the same time, the mysticism of the doctrine introduced other elements. The location of the discussions were frequently the residences of the Kshatriyas or occasionally those of the Brahmans. It was understood that the new doctrine was concerned with knowledge, not about the mundane world, but with the conceptualization of knowledge of other worlds, although this exploration helped systematize knowledge about the mundane world. The shifting of the focus to methods of attaining knowledge rather than conforming to ritual was a new experience, but sacrificial rituals were not suddenly discontinued. The deities of earlier times were not denied, but their role tended to gradually fade away. <coughs> if the sacrificial ritual was limited in its efficacy or ineffective in its purpose, then what were the other forms which could be central to the human condition? These interests revolved around questions of mortality and immortality, the immortality of the soul, the realization of the self, belief in rebirth and retribution. Much of this was tied into examining the nature of reality. Is it what we perceive around us? Or is there a reality beyond this which becomes tangible only through new techniques of perception. These techniques involved control over the complementary categories of body and mind, yoga, and meditation, dhyana, both idly requiring a form of life given to austerity, if not asceticism, in the pasya. This centered on the individual as the seeker of immortality through his own effort. Salvation of a limited kind had been present in the ritual of sacrifice, intended, among other things, for the attainment 
of the heightened pleasures of the heaven of Indra. But now, the concern was not for heaven, but for release or liberation or moksha. This was not initially associated with sin and redemption, but was conceptualized as the liberation of the soul. Moksha was seen as related to the concept of Atman Brahman. Brahman, necessary to the creation of the universe which it enters, is manifest in the Atman, the soul, which is an essential part of every individual life. Moksha, therefore, lies in achieving the realization of the Atman, releasing it from the bonds of the body, and from repeatedly having to undergo death and rebirth from body to body. The transmigration of the Atman has to cease before moksha is possible. In other words, the caterpillar has to stop moving from leaf to leaf. Perhaps because the new doctrine distanced itself from the sacrificial ritual and also drew on mystic concepts, claiming almost supernatural powers, it was referred to as the secret doctrine, rahasya. One statement actually equating the secret document uh, the secret doctrine, doctrine with the Upanishad. The texts tend to retain this character of closed knowledge. There was a questioning of the sacrificial cult, for it could not be a means of liberating the Atman. The Vedas were said to be inferior to the now more frequently discussed alternative belief systems. Sarcastic references to the greedy behavior of priests at the sacrificial ritual highlight doubts about the ritual and its main actors. Apart from questioning the sacrificial ritual, another startling feature is that the exploration of these new ideas was often not by Brahmins, as would be expected, but by Kshatriyas. The noticeably important role of the Kshatriyas has been commented upon both in the Upanishads and by modern scholars. The Raja of the Panchal says to the learned Brahman Gautama, I quote, this knowledge has never in the past been vested in any Brahman, but I shall tell it to you, unquote. This is striking, coming from the Raja of Kuru Panchala, an area noted for its learned Brahmins and frequency of the best sacrificial rituals. Those who discoursed on the doctrine taught it either to their sons or to selected pupils. These Kshatriyas included the Rajas of the Ushinara and Matsya clans, and of the Kekeya, the Kuru Panchala, Kashi, Koshala, and above all, Janaka of Videha substantially the western and middle Ganges plain. It is impressive that this vast geographical area saw the mobility of Rajas, Brahmans, and ideas at so early a stage. The interest of the Brahmans in the new teaching may have stemmed from dissidents seeking alternative philosophies or the curious exploring new ideas. Those attracted to asceticism would have supported such discussion. However, some Brahmins who taught the new doctrine received lavish gifts or charged huge fees. And others are described on occasion as extremely wealthy and learned, who were by no account ascetics. Categories of knowledge were hierarchical, reflecting a spectrum of interests and incorporated what appears to be a folk or subaltern knowledge. A distinction was made between knowledge as and for ritual, as intuition, as intellectual speculation which encouraged debate and the dialectical form of argument, and as knowledge of the Atman. The participation of some Brahmins may have led to the eventual inclusion of this material as part of the Vedic corpus. And it also has occasional references to other earlier Vedic compositions. But the later appropriation of the Upanishads in the Vedic texts could also have been an attempt to stem the heresies 
of the Buddhists and other sects by tracing the origins of their deviation to Upanishadic thought. Modern philosophers continue to disagree as to whether Buddhism is to be treated as a part of the spectrum of post-Vedic thought rooted in the Upanishads or as a radical departure from the Upanishads. The new teaching moves away from Brahmins as priests to Kshatriyas and Brahmins as teachers, parallel to the shift away from ritual and religious duties, which required a high degree of specialization in mantras and rites. Max Weber distinguishes between the priest, the magician, and the charismatic prophet. The priest entreats deity via prayer and sacrifice. The magician coerces deity via ritual. The priests eventually emerge as functionaries of a social group rather than individuals, and their office becomes hereditary. The teachers of the Upanishads do not fall into any of these categories as they are distinct from the priests, and although their teaching leads to a new belief, a new belief system of a higher order, they are not prophets. Priests as mediators between men and gods were not required in this new doctrine. Knowledge had earlier included the kinds of questions controlled by the traditional priest, but in effect, the new knowledge superseded the old. The move away from the sacrificial ritual requires some comment. The term for sacrifice, yagya, means to conse consecrate, to worship, to convert the profane into the holy. Sacrifice as a ritual involves the following. The one ordering the sacrifice, or the patron of the ritual, as he has been called, the yajamana the gods to whom the prayer is addressed, the Brahman priests who act as intermediaries and mediate between the patron and the gods, and the offering, the bali, which is transferred from the ownership of the patron and gifted to the gods via the mediation of the priests. There is no counter-transfer of any visible equivalent. The yajamana or patron has first to be changed from a profane condition to a sacralized one. This involves a lengthy purification when all other activities were set aside, which automatically excluded as yajamanas those who were essential to the daily curriculum, such as men who labored and women. The yajamana is stripped of authority during this process and undergoes a change of status through ritual uh, cleansing. The location for the ceremony had also to be purified and demarcated, for outside this area, all killing was not immolation but murder. The offering can be first fruits, the bali and the bhaga, or can be specially selected objects such as animals, which are identified as the victims of the ritual. The offering is owned by the yajamana and is of value, which introduces an element of renunciation. An offering implies an existing asymmetrical relationship, whereas a gift creates such a relationship. Theories on the purpose and function of the sacrifice range over many explanations such as homage to and communion with the gods, catharsis, renunciation, rejuvenation, and social legitimacy. The Vedic sacrifice had many functions, but what it distinctly was not was a covenant between a man and his jealous god. The Brahman as priest had a relationship of reciprocity with the kshatriya embodying political power. The sacrificial ritual was an exchange in which the gods were the recipients of the offerings, bali, the priests were the recipients of gifts and fees, dana and dakshina, and the kshatriya, as the one who orders the ritual, was the recipient of the benevolence of the gods and of status and legitimacy among men. Reciprocity involves an offering, a giving up, 
or sacrifice of something valuable. For the Kshatriya, this consisted of the visible Bali, the voluntary tribute in the form of material goods, as well as the acceptance of the mediation of the Brahman with the gods, which was to some degree an acceptance of the Kshatriya's dependence on the Brahman. The priests were therefore deeply involved in the articulation of power through their relationship with the Kshatriya Rajas and the ritual of sacrifice. The new teaching, however, had little use for this particular interconnection. Admittedly, the same two social categories, the Kshatriya and the Brahman, who were the main participants in the sacrificial ritual, are now involved in the new doctrine but their roles and purposes are different. A sacrificial ritual involves resources. It also requires the mobilizing of resources and attention to the social problems posed by the procurement of offerings. The required wealth could be a substantial part, a portion of the Yajamana's resources. Not only was the best of livestock sacrificed, but the gifts to be made to the priests in terms of cattle wealth and golden objects, if taken literally, would have materially impoverished many a patron. When something of value was offered, it was in the belief and expectation of receiving in return, at a later point, something of even greater value. The frequency of the ritual, such as daily or new and full moon and seasonal sacrifices, which increased with the agricultural calendar, or rites of passage, or those intended to obtain either a boon or an expiation, would be in part dependent on the availability of offerings. The mobilizing of resources would initially be the responsibility of the family and clan members, where resources were limited. The common sharing of offerings enhanced the unity of the participants. This would make, this make the sacrifice a collective activity. Gradually, the collective element receded and the focus was on the individual patron. This was the price paid by the individual aspiring to status and power and using the sacrificial ritual as an agency for claiming legitimacy. The power was intended to assert an authority beyond that of the ordinary as chief of the clan. This authority was to increase over time and become qualitatively different in the claim not of chiefship but of kingship with the mutation of chiefdoms into kingdoms. There was an element of gift exchange involved in the relationship between the Brahman and the Kshatriya through the sacrificial ritual. The participants were not of equal status, and the Brahmans, even when consecrating a chief or a king, stated their independence by their allegiance to Soma. Reciprocity was not always balanced, and the obligation to give was that of the Kshatriya, and to receive that of the Brahman. The exchange was not protected by law, but was dictated by custom. The acceptance of the gift bound the two participants as partners and reiterated their bonds. The historical context to the sacrificial ritual is first met with in the <coughs> compositions of the Rig Veda. The function of the Raja as the warrior chief was to protect the Vish or the clan and to augment resources through cattle raids which in a cattle-rearing culture are imperative. A successful raid required leadership, but also drew on the prayers of priests interceding with the gods. The subsequent ritual was a thanksgiving and a means of distributing the booty. This was the subject of the many dhanastutis, or hymns of praise, in which <coughs> Brahman poets eulogized the prowess of those rajas who had increased their wealth through raids. Wealth was computed primarily in terms of cattle, horses, chariots, and gold. These were often listed in exaggerated amounts, 60,000 head of cattle or 1,000 horse, where the exaggeration was intended as an incentive 
to those Rajas who had heard the praise of others and it was hoped would emulate them. The ritual conferred legitimacy on the Raja. The hymns of praise articulated his power. The Raja bestowed gifts in the form of wealth on the priests and acquired status in return. This was of central importance in societies which consisted of small, highly competitive groups in which there could be a quick turnover of status, resources, and power. Subsequent to this, two trends become evident. One was the concentration of power with the Raja, described more often now as the Kshatriya. This was accompanied by a change in the primary resource base from cattle herding to agriculture, and particularly so with wet rice cultivation in the Middle Ganges Plain. The Kshatriya was not just the cattle raiding warrior. He now augmented his wealth by settling new lands and encouraging their cultivation. The territories where the clan settled, known as the Janapadas, were named after the Kshatriya ruling clan, such as the Kuru Panchala, Koshala, Videha, and so on. This did not imply their ownership of the land, but is indicative of enhanced political power. Cultivation was carried out by the clansmen, assisted by the labor of the shudras and the dasas, the fourth caste and the slaves, uh, who were outside the clan. The kshatriya demanded and received prestations from them. We are told that the kshatriya eats the vish, or the clan, as the deer eats the grain. And so the clan is subordinate to the kshatriya. The occasion for making prestations was the sacrificial ritual, and this was the second feature which had begun to change. There were now a variety of sacrifices which ranged from simple daily rituals required of heads of households to many very elaborate ones. The most complex were those asserting Kshatriya authority and often lasting over many months, such as the Rajasuya and the Ashwamedha or the Vajapeya the reju rejuvenation ritual. The Rajasuya, in turn, involved the conquest of the four quarters, in theory, and the amassing of tribute before the ritual could begin. Kshatriyas who performed these rites were transformed, we are told, from Rajas into Maharajas, even greater kings. Such rituals often incorporated the rhetoric and symbols of the raids and skirmishes of pastoral societies, even though these were now transitional to established kingdoms. Simple rituals could require the gifting of a cow to the priest, but elaborate rituals brought in large amounts of wealth as sacrificial fees and gifts. Such rituals, therefore, were in effect a display consumption and destruction of wealth, and therefore presupposed the availability of considerable resources to the patron of the ritual. The specific use to which the wealth was put tended to convert the sacrifice into something of a potlatch. The more the wealth expended on the ritual, the more it was assumed would come back to the patron, through the pleasure of the gods, the discipline of giving, successful warfare, and good harvests. And beyond that, it further raised the standing of the patron. But it did, at the same time, deplete his treasury. The competitive spirit, encouraged by the earlier eulogistic hymns, still persisted and probably resulted in terms of wealth in what has been called an alternating disequilibrium. Where the heads of the household, the Grihapati, uh, were encouraged to perform frequent calendrical sacrifices, there the voluntary tribute which they gave to the Kshatriya would also decrease because of the demands of these sacrifices. Given the absence of burials in the cultures of the Ganges Plain, unlike most other contemporary high cultures in Asia, the utilization of wealth was concentrated on the ritual of sacrifice. The ritual, therefore, combines a testimony of religious affirmation 
with a claim to status on the part of the yajamana or patron, as well as a demonstration of wealth and resources. Potlatch, it has been argued, is aimed at maximizing net outgoings. Property is distributed seemingly voluntarily, but in fact under compulsion of the ritual. Ostensibly, it bears no interest, although the higher return is implicit. This, however, is different from capital accumulation, since it cannot be collected on demand or be repaid at all. The obtaining of gifts and wealth for the ritual is from the labor of the family and kinsmen. When this system changes and the labor of non-clan persons is introduced, with fresh adjustments in relationships between the clans and within the clans, then the handling of wealth also begins to change. Access to wealth begins to require coercive measures. The production of wealth draws on a different kind of impersonal relationship. In such a situation, attitudes to the sacrificial ritual by the major patrons would presumably also change. The historical background to the Upanishads depicts a society which is no longer predominantly that of cattle herding clans. The more common occupation is agriculture with some incipient trade. The frequent and ready violence of raids is now substituted by political control and alliances. Agricultural resources required not capturing and raiding, but the availability of regular and coordinated labor. This is reflected in the intensification of the caste hierarchy, where the upper castes claim lineage descent, whereas the fourth caste, that of the Shudras, has no lineage base. This was a method of distancing those who provided labor. Claims to ownership of land still lay largely with the clan, although a slow shift is perceptible to claims by families, perhaps as a result of the rights of use. In the Middle Ganges region, marshlands and forest were cleared for settlement, assisted to some degree by the new technology using iron. The cultivation of wet rice led to larger yields and increased wealth. The consumption of wealth in sacrificial rituals may initially have been a stimulus to production, but perhaps when resources could not keep pace with this consumption, the ritual began to have a negative effect. Unlike the produce of herders, grain can be stored for long periods and some accumulation is possible. This may also have resulted in an upward demographic trend requiring more resources. Archaeology provides evidence of increasing numbers of settlements and larger settlements, some of which were to gradually develop into urban centers. Kshatriya rule over these settlements was intended to protect the settlers and maintain minimum law. For this, the Kshatriya received a share of the produce in the form of what began as voluntary tributes, such as the Bali and the Bhaga, from the heads of households, tributes which were eventually to evolve into taxes. This encouraged the accumulation of wealth and was to become the wherewithal for the emergence of kingdoms and states. Such wealth was necessary to the new demands of incipient state systems, such as rudimentary administration, armies, and the expenses of kingship. In addition, the universalizing of religious belief and practice, as in Buddhism, could lend ideological support to the state, as it was to do in the Mauryan period. Let us return to the question of why the Kshatriyas explored the doctrine of the Upanishads. Were they moving away from the sacrificial ritual solely because of philosophical curiosity? Or was there also, perhaps subconsciously, a search for an alternative which would discourage the expending of wealth? This wealth could be diverted towards maintaining a state system with enhanced powers for the Kshatriyas, far exceeding those of the earlier chiefships. However, this was not seen in terms of 
rational well-being or economic theory. The discontinuance of the sacrificial ritual would break the nexus between the Brahman and the Kshatriya and would provide a new role for the Kshatriya more in consonance with the broader changes of the time. The Brahman and the Kshatriya were interlocked in a competition for status, but the sacrificial ritual, although seemingly separating their powers, in fact made them interdependent the Kshatriya may have preferred to be released from this dependence. The reality of power was now seen not only as divine dispensation, but also as access to resources. The power of the Kshatriya did not need to be circumscribed by the sacrificial ritual. The new doctrine required discipline, meditation, and concern with the self. It called neither for <coughs> intermediaries nor deities, which therefore gave it a universalism in the pursuit of moksha or liberation. Whereas the sacrificial ritual required the contribution to a greater or lesser degree of the clan and thereby underlined clan identity, the new doctrine moved away from this identity and underlined the separation of the individual from the clan. Meditation and yoga are best undertaken in isolation subsequent to the initial period of training with a teacher. The clan, therefore, was marginalized and the individual emerged as the subject seeking knowledge and liberation. This placed a premium on removing oneself from one's society and renouncing social obligations, a sentiment which goes counter to the involvement in clan activities required by the earlier rituals. Renunciation is also contrary to the accumulation of wealth, but the notion of such an accumulation was probably necessary for the idea of renunciation to be effective. The focus on the individual highlights the anomie of changing social relations with the breaking up of clans as well as the alienation and skepticism implicit in the new identities em emerging in nascent urban centers. This was to be further reinforced by the centrality of individual nirvana in subsequent teachings. If the reasons why the Kshatriya was supportive of this doctrine have to do both with philosophical curiosity and changes in social and political forms, these do not entirely explain its attraction for some Brahmins. The turning of the focus of these ideas, however, introduces a more substantial Brahmanical concern. It is significant that not all Brahmins were familiar with the new doctrine. It was viewed initially as rather esoteric, meant only for the selected few. Those that supported it saw the limitations of the rituals and sought more innovative forms of liberation, even if these ultimately involved renunciation. The use of the vocabulary of release in relation to the soul may have been partially associated with release from social obligations as well. Did renunciation carry a nostalgia for the nomadic life which was disappearing? Or was it a concern that radical ideas had to be introduced gradually and that renunciation would provide freedom to experiment with new ideas, a freedom not permitted by rigid, rigidly controlled rituals? Sporadic but vague speculation on these matters has been traced to earlier Vedic compositions. The departure lay in the forging of a consistent theory for which the observance of the earlier rituals was not required. The constructing of this theory has its own history. Shamanistic origins have been suggested in references to Munis, Rishis, and Keshans, the long-haired ones flying through the air, living in isolation, and seeking their own forms of knowledge, which included magic and meditation. They were the forerunners of the renouncers and the ascetics. 
The Yatu Dhana may well have been shamans and therefore seen as sorcerers and alien by Vedic priests. The lengthy period of training under a teacher, as envisaged in the Upanishads, requiring a desocialization from the family, together with the secrecy of the doctrine, are suggestive of shamanistic influence, as are also descriptions of the journeying of the soul. The soul goes through the air, which opens out like a hole in the chariot wheel. It goes to the sun and the moon. It journeys to the world of Brahma, which is an elaborate movement through many deities and many heavens. It enters the cloud and then the rain, the plants and the crops, which when eaten, takes it into the human body. The Atman can be larger than the universe and smaller than the mustard seed. The ecstatic state of the Atman when released from rebirth echoes shamanistic ecstasy when the spirit is said to be in communion with the divine. These descriptions of the journeying of the soul and the idea of souls inhabiting plants and animals were not, as many have pointed out, altogether alien to animistic views on the passage of the spirit. If the archaeological picture of the Ganges plain provides a clue, it is that of a variety of coexisting and overlapping cultures. Fertility cults grew around the worship of trees and female deities. The stupa as a tumulus, perhaps with some funerary association, may also have drawn on ideas of a soul and afterlife different from the Vedic. The working out of the doctrine involved knowledge which moved from ritual to analytical and speculative argument, but included meditation and contemplation. Thus, Sanat Kumar asks to be taught the knowledge of the Atman, knowledge which later was to be regarded as the higher knowledge as against the lower knowledge of the Vedas. The sage Udala Karuni, conversing with his arrogant son, Shreta Ketu, provides an explanation of Atman which is almost rational in its consideration of questions, of doubts, of observation, and in its attempts at making categories. Among the most subtle discussions of the Atman is the dialogue between Nachiketas and Yama, the god of death. The Atman is described as the charioteer of the body, which is the chariot, a strongly Kshatriya symbol. Moksha was the releasing of the Atman from the cycle of repeated death, Punaramrityu, because of being reincarnated in a body. The notion of Moksha as distinct from heaven introduced a change in the meaning of death where the ideal was not a blissful life in the heaven of the heroes, but the release from being repeatedly reborn. The breaking away from ritual and the search for knowledge about the soul and immortality led to other explorations of the self. But the theory was to be further formulated in a manner which linked it once more with social reality. This lay in the concept of karma and sansara, the actions of one's life determining the future rebirth of one's atma, an idea further developed by Yajnavalkya amongst others. On death, there are two possible paths which the soul can take. One is the devayana, the path of the gods, taken by the soul of one who meditates, has knowledge of Brahman, and does not have to undergo rebirth. The soul ascends by stages through the day, the bright fortnight of the month, the six month period, the year, to the sun, the lightning, and on, on to Brahman, never to return. The other path, the Pitriyana, the path of the ancestors, because of the ties to rituals and actions, is a temporary residence for the soul. For remaining on the moon until its karma is exhausted, the soul enters a new birth, returning via the air, smoke, vapor, cloud, and rain into crops. A mortal, we are told, ripens like grain, and like grain 
is born again. Repeated rebirth is a form of retribution. And then comes the crucial question. What determines the rebirth of the soul in a particular body? To this, the answer is that if the individual's life has been one of good actions, then the soul is reborn among the higher castes, Brahman, Kshatriya, or Vesh. But if the actions have been evil, then the choice of rebirth is among the lowly, the dog, the pig, or the chandal, the outcast. There had been a trace in this idea of an element of chance, since the soul entering a new body would have depended on who eats the plant. But this element of chance was to be denied by the increasing insistence on the ethical imperative. The answer to the next question, namely, who determines good or bad conduct, was in later times and among some important sects, said to lie in the hands of those who prepared the norms of social behavior, the Brahman authors of the Dharma Shastras. According to them, release from rebirth was possible only by observing the Dharma of caste. Those born among the upper castes can claim a virtuous previous life in accordance with the rules of dharma. The condemnation of the chandala, or the outcast, to the status of the despised assumed that the chandala was receiving the just merit of evil conduct in a previous life. Dharma now replaced the sacrifice as that which sustains the universe. The explanation of social inequalities on the basis of transmigration could keep society under the control of those who pronounced on conduct. The irrelevance, in effect, of caste status in the new doctrine was nullified by this explanation of social differentiation. At one level, what began as a search for an alternative path to releasing the Atman was pursued as such but in social practice, it was also reduced to a means of controlling the less privileged and justifying their condition on ethical grounds of karma. Reincarnation and karma are logically separable, since moral justice can be accorded in other ways, as the eschatology of various religions suggests. At the philosophical and religious level, the theory of karma was to become a central marker differentiating Indian religions from Semitic religions. Much of what followed in ideas of salvation within the Indian tradition drew on this theory. The new doctrine did not remain secret for very long. It was carried from place to place by wandering teachers, and inevitably much of the post-Upanishadic thought traced itself to these ideas, but developed them in variant ways some endorsing them and others opposing them. Frequently, the more prominent of the new teachers, such as Mahavira and the Buddha, were Kshatriyas, and the social aspects of the new philosophies were in part circumscribed by their concerns. A later Upanishad, more conservative, is clear in its hostility to the contrary doctrines of those who wear the red robes and are opposed to the Vedas. This was the birth of heterodoxy. The theory of Atman Brahman relating to the immortality of the soul and its release from the bonds of the body was a philosophical innovation. Even by implication, it was a negation of the centrality of the prevalent sacrificial ritual. I have tried to argue that the search for an ideology independent of the sacrificial ritual may have had among its many concerns the wish to conserve wealth. This was necessary to the transition from clan-based societies to states and kingdoms, where the relative egalitarianism of the former gave way to the enhanced power of the Kshatriyas. Interestingly, in the oligarchies and kingdoms of the sub subsequent period, where Kshatriyas were dominant, 
there is either an absence in sacrificial rituals or a decrease in frequency. The notion of transmigration being determined by the rules of caste reinstated the authority of the Brahman, even outside the sacrificial ritual, as being preeminent among those determining the rules of conduct. These were issues widely debated in post-Upanishadic times. Arguing, as I have done, for a correlation between sacrifices, resources, and innovations in belief systems is not just an economistic enterprise. It is an attempt to insist that ideologies are not chronos-free or history-free. In the complexities associated with Upanishadic and consequent ideas, there are earlier features which are transmuted and others which are conditioned by contemporary needs. These may have coincided with the free-floating visions of the sages. Elements of embedded social contours in the sacrificial ritual need not be ignored in the larger explanation of philosophical speculation. The universalizing of the doctrine influenced many sects and schools of thought which were to alter the intellectual landscape of early India. The centrality of the sacrificial ritual was displaced by the centrality of the notion of transmigration. This carried within it both the movement of the caterpillar from leaf to leaf, as well as the mutation of the object of gold. The pursuit of comprehending the immortality of the soul was intense. It moved from analytical arguments and discriminating discussion to a mystical idealism couched in a poetically rich language. A different kind of immortality was bestowed on the discourses of the Upanishads, which in themselves were to become the fountainhead of ideologies, some supportive and some dissenting, but both fashioning much of subsequent Indian thought. questions that are posed are not questions, uh, are, are questions that arise out of daily existence. And uh, the answers that are given are answers which partly touch on <coughs> questions of daily, uh, the, the mundane world, as it were, but not entirely. There, there's a kind of play between uh, what is perceivable, what is normal, what is mundane, and what is speculative. So rational is based on Mundane observations. Mundane observations, yes, I'm using it in a very literal sense. How do you uh, uh, interpret the social s stage during the cattle breeding period of earlier Upanishad and later on? On the, uh, I mean, from primitive, do you do you do you agree with the? Uh, formulation that it was from primitive communism, it went to slavery period. No, 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 I don't, I'm sorry, I don't accept that formulation. Um, this is um, Dange's formulation. Yeah. And uh, uh, I find his book very, very difficult to accept because he pushes the etymology in directions <laughs> that are uh, really not possible. Um, actually, what I'm, I'm arguing is that the, if, if one is talking about the period of the Upanishads as from the 8th to the 6th centuries, 
that this is already uh, a situation in which there is a pastoral agricultural society with a greater emphasis on agriculture. Uh, and what is happening is sharper social stratification of various kinds, which is very clear in the post-Upanishadic period in the Ganarajyas and the, the kingdoms of Koshala and Maghad. But I certainly wouldn't talk about primitive communism and slavery. I wonder if in any of the missions it's mentioned that uh, how often the atma or the soul resides in the human form, in one son. Is there any number of you? Uh, I honestly don't remember coming across any number, but uh, I don't know if anyone else would like to answer that question. As far as I know from my reading of them, I don't think any number is given. Uh, in, in the nature of the doctrine, a number would not be expected. Um, you've given us some sense of what a Kshatriya could do, in some sense to be a good Kshatriya. But uh, when the Brahmins laid down how to be a good whatever you were born as, was there anything specific about how what uh, was called upon if you were to be a good chandar or for that matter a good dog or a good farmer? Uh, no. Know? Well, the, 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 the <coughs> rules of conduct are really for members of the four castes, of, of the four varnas. Uh, obviously, if if you were to be a good chandal, you were to be totally subordinate and sub subservient and accept whatever conduct was meted out to you. Uh, you were not supposed to protest, you were not supposed to object, you were not supposed to better your condition by arguing that you were human and therefore not to be treated in that fashion. So if you were born as a, a pig or a dog, I mean, there's, you could just remain trapped in that condition. Uh, you, I suppose you could. I mean, the, the, the point, of course, is that this is being treated symbolically. The, the, the differentiation that is being made is that evil conduct can lead to all kinds of lowly births. Uh, this doesn't mean later on, of course, when it is developed, the rules of conduct are only for human, uh, the human condition, not for the soul transmigrating into animals or creatures or anything of that kind, <coughs> but only for human beings. Um, the, you know, the, I, I found the, uh, one of the things that bothers me a little bit is the assumption that history in North India can be seen as exclusive, as sort of starting with the Vedas and going on from there with nothing no other extraneous element coming into it. And we're supposed to imagine that everything that was there before the Aryans arrived simply uh, disappeared into a black hole and somehow had no, um, no effect on anything subsequently. Um, so I found, you said again and again, that the Upanishads are entirely new. And yet, surely, uh, one must uh, at least, I mean, but isn't it a good, I mean, I would, at least for me, my feeling reading the Upanishads is that something there is coming out that was, that's probably rather old and even pre vedic And simply to, to suggest how complex things are, I just remarked that uh, there is, um, I think, pretty un incontrovertible evidence that the caste system in South India is pre aryan it's not brought by the Aryans. It's, it's a rather different system, not the Varna system, but it certainly had all the elements that we think of today as the Jati system before the Aryans ever got to South India. So that many of these things that you describe, uh, it seems to me very likely, and of course other people have said this, are simply recurrences of pre-Aryan patterns and ideas which are resurfacing. Uh, Yes, well, two things. One, uh, when I said that it's new, I'm talking about it as a consistently constructed theory. Uh, that is new, uh, the, the way in which it's worked out as a body of text, as a body of, it, of knowledge, as a body of discourse and discussion. Uh, clearly, there are elements that do 
uh, go to more than just the Vedic texts. I thought I had mentioned some of these. Uh, and I agree that there are uh, a variety of cultures in existence, not all of which uh, conform to the kind of uh, society that is described in the Vedic texts. But I think that one can err in the other direction and try and uh, suggest that much of what was going on went back to a hoary past, uh, unless there is evidence to support that. And unfortunately, uh, this is where one waits desperately for the decipherment of the Harappan script, because possibly some of these queries about how far back certain ideas went, how far back certain institutions went, uh, would be clarified once that happens. But on the basis of the archaeological evidence that we have, we can certainly suggest that there were elements from elsewhere that went into the making of these ideas, as indeed I thought I had suggested in, in my talk. Uh, but as a consistent theory in a body of texts, this is really the first time that it's put forward. <coughs> well, I was wondering a little bit about the shape of some of the <coughs> Hindu temples. You know, they seem like they're almost like step pyramids, like in Mexico when they had human sacrifices in Mesopotamia, where they supposedly had human sacrifices. Is there? Anything in um, Indian antiquity to suggest that they also had human sacrifices? There isn't really. This is a subject that has been discussed at great length, uh, has been gone into, and the connections haven't been established. Uh, the way to self-realization strikes me as a very individual path, meaning um, that the terminology in which I relate to my inner images has to do with my upbringing as a child or with my social surroundings. Now in today's world, you have different cultures mixing like never before. You have Africans coming to the States, Germans going to India. Now, how do you see the development that is happening today on a global scale in relation to what you mentioned in the ancient history? I should imagine the development today makes self-realization much more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good last word. <laughs>